Okay, I turned the lights back on. Now, I want to head this off at the pass because there's going to be somebody complaining or objecting. Saying, oh, brain out, that can't be true. That's too, you know, that, that you have to really like eisegete to read that into it. No. You know how I know for sure? Well, because it keeps on repeating the same the same adroitness keeps on repeating throughout all the rest of the references. You'll have to read the whole thing to see why because the whole Byzantine history um, I had to end up summarizing with links, external links to it in each one of these notes. So when you read the history and you see what's being referenced in the keywords that are used for those rulers in that time, it's like there's too many there's, there's too much satire that's biting and accurate relative to that emperor of that time to be, uh, what do you want to call it, coincidental. But there's another reason, and it's really important that you know this. And you can talk to any, any scholar you want who knows something about Latin and Greek drama or Latin and Greek plays, or Latin and Greek literature, or a even Latin and Greek rhetoric. Okay. They used, and they specialized in and prided themselves on sound play and word play that was uh, satirical and often bawdy. And an example I'm going to give you, you can look up or talk to somebody, they'll know of this, it's a famous example. The trouble is I don't remember for sure which emperor it was, whether it was Claudius or Marcus Aurelius. But one of those two had a wife who was playing out on him, you know, sleeping with somebody else. This somebody else is the, the guy's name that she was sleeping with was Tertullian. Or T Tertullus, I think. Tertullus something like that and it was wide knowledge in Rome that that she was doing that and so one of the playwrights actually wrote a play a comedy of mistaken identity and stuff and there was one line where he was asked some que some question about who did this or who said that and it was it was risque Okay, and the guy's answer is Tur Tur Tullus. Okay, everybody hearing him say that line knew he was making a reference to the, you know, the Empress's um, lover. Everybody knew it, and it. I don't know if it's Dio Cassius who recorded that or Suetonius or who knows that you know talk to the scholars that you want to talk to but you can even probably google on it Ter Tertullian or Ter Tertullus Ter means three and it was a play on three in the play but it was actually a play on the lover's name so when I'm sitting here going ooh 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 or uh, oh, 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 oh. And that's when Constantius II dies. That's actually a very common style in Greek and Roman literature. That's where I'm getting it from. Alright? I didn't know any of this existed. That's why I'm learning it. It's like what it's like this is like a jigsaw puzzle to me. And as it comes together, I'm like, oh my god, this is, this is a killer. The very year that Jerome finishes his Gospels, his Gospels. Remember, Mark is writing this in 69 AD. Jerome didn't exist. The very year is being predicted here. And as if you've seen the, Mark 20, the Matthew 24 videos, every time the word kurios is used, in Matthew 24 and 25, it denotes a Bible translation, a Bible teacher, a Bible reformer. For 2,000 years of history?
And we're in three of those years, four of those years right now. I have no idea. I mean, some kind of Bible discovery is going on. And you know, maybe it's the meter. Maybe it's something else. Somebody's finding something really significant about Bible that'll be of historical importance, or already has, and I just don't know about it. Between 2015 and 2018, Matthew 25:11, the two lords signify that, and they signify other things too, as I've been saying. But this is the kind of sophistication here. Ew, good. That's the prefix for good. Yeah, it's good to have it translated in Latin that's in the vernacular because the Latin everybody was stuck with by the time this happens in 400 was 200 year old Latin. And Latin, you know, when an inflected language changes, that's that makes it much harder to read. Ours is, in English is not so hard. But it is pretty hard to go back and read the King James. It's not as hard as it could be, but it's like, look. Alright? So and and it just keeps on it keeps on going from here, okay? Like um, here, Valentinian the third is killed 455 A.D. That's the end of the clause here. Don't worry about what you're gonna say. Why? Well, the implication, by just that clause by itself, don't worry about what you're going to say, means that you're going to be in front of somebody who has the power to hurt you if you say the wrong thing. And what, what would give rise to that? Well, how about the fact that Valentinian's own advisor assassinated him? If you were living, starting in 445, because 415 plus 30 you would be very well aware at the very beginning of this ooh times are not good it was a very very bad time in the Eastern Empire everybody was killing everybody else you had this woman named Polcaria and there was nothing beautiful about her who was trying to run everything okay and as a result of it you know, Valentinian the third ends up getting killed. Assassinated. And then she marries she marries um I mean it's it's more of a story than that because she's actually in the East, but the East sort of like helped the West get killed. The the uh, Valentinian get killed. And that's what's basically what he's saying here, Adelphos Adelphon. In other words, the East was the brother of the West and delivered him over to death. This is actually marking, okay, at the start of this word here, the start of Thanatos, which means death. That very start, just, just before you say the ta, that's 476 AD when Western Rome dies under Odovacar. Brother delivered brother over to death. The East wouldn't help the West. They wouldn't help. Well, they were thinking, oh, good, now, you know, this is like the Democrats and the Republicans, okay? The East said, oh, well, you know, well, if the West goes down, then we can take it over. And they'll be so grateful to see us, they'll pay higher taxes. So why should you help the West? Yeah. And there was a conspiracy to kill Valentinian III at the West. Which Polkiria was very happy to do. She was in the East. Okay? So brother against brother to death. And the word death is marking the actual death. The actual death of Western Rome in 476 AD. Can it get more pointed than that? Now, I'm going to leave it there. Because if, if you don't notice that this is on purpose, by now, then I don't know that any more words from you are going to help. Peace out. Okay, there are a couple more things I want to cover to show you how awesome this is. Again, we're on Mark 13. 
It's all the same document. I split the window. And what I want to demonstrate to you is just how reliable is the text we have at knowing that if it's, you know, I mean, it's like 99.99% sure that the words we got are the words that the writers wrote. Because the technique that's used here to demonstrate that the people who copied these words didn't know. So how could they have copied so accurately if God didn't enable it, alright? Now let me give you a real good example of this. Here in each of these sections, you know, this, this will take you to the notes. This will take you to the notes that I put about Matthew in Mark so it would be easier to cross-reference. But each one of these things is what's called an anaphora. An anaphora is usually a phrase, but here uh, Mark is using each word individually. Paul had done that too. Christ did it first. But it's much more sophisticated and detailed in Paul, Luke, and Mark than Christ did it. He did a broad brush for the whole world. They're now taking out certain um, geographical areas. Mark and uh, Mark takes the east and Luke and Paul had taken the west. And I discovered Paul's doing it first. I didn't know about any of this until, you know, six years later, which was last year. So, in mapping it, I'm like, okay, let's apply the same techniques because I wanted to know where Paul got his style from because everything's based on a precedent in the Bible. All right? So here's the first one, blepo. And I just covered that. Every time you see the word blepo, see to it, look. Um, it's going to stand for years during which some emperor that uh, God wants you to pay attention to dies. And therefore, you know, why did he die? What, what kind of ruling did he have? And the most important thing the Bible focuses on, was there interest in Bible or not? Did Bible get out? Did Bible get better known? Did the people learn it? And usually in the Byzantine, for the Byzantine Eastern Empire, the sad fact is no. And yet they're the ones who had more of the original text. The West only had the Latin. That's the big sad thing. The West had the Latin. The Greek text they didn't care about. They translated into Latin under Jerome, like I mentioned in the prior increment. And after that, they really didn't care about the Greek. Every once in a while, however, a few Catholics who were busy working on Bible manuscripts or whatever would say, Oh, you know what? I'm not so sure our Latin translation is any good. Let's go find the Greek and see. And Jerome was one of those guys, and he actually traveled to... Um, St. Catherine's Monastery and he was looking at the Hebrew there he actually had to learn how to learn Hebrew um, so he learned Hebrew and he learned he learned he got a hold of the text from Jews that were you know in the Palestine area and then he's retranslating and checking against his Latin script and he sees all these errors and we know that that's what happened because he kept on writing Augustine about it so a lot of letters back and forth between him and Augustine on what he was doing. And every time he'd finish a little bit of his translation, he'd send it out to his friends. And we got all those letters, too. So we know what was happening. Okay, we know that, that the Latin was preferred. And Augustine didn't even want Jerome to retranslate it from the Greek and the Hebrew. Okay, but in the East, they had the text. They didn't have popes in the East. All the religious claptrap was held by the, the kings. Alright? So, the kings are tracked with blepo. And, I mean, come on, can you be more satirical? At the moment you die, blepo is the thing that's marking your death? See to it, you're not seeing anything when you die. And, of course, that's the satire. Hi, king, I put you on this earth. I gave you this high position. I gave you all this control over scripture. And what'd you do with it? You didn't see it. So now you're not going to see anything, and everybody's going to see you die. 
it's that biting and I also found the Terra Terra Tullus link that I was talking about in the prior videos I put it in uh, part 3 of the Mark 13 videos that are up already so you can go look up that link it's Eon Tibby Dixiter Tullus is the line you want to look at look for it's in Latin and it's a play on Faustina the wife of Marcus Aurelius she supposedly had a lover named Tertullus and so the line in the play is to make fun of her lover but they have to be very careful how they do it because otherwise they can get killed that's the way this text is written too so it's sarcastic and it's pointed and at the same time it's very subtle okay so blepite is used to mark deaths every single time so that's the blepo anaphora and it's got other uses to it that, that are covered in the notes but that's the header and that these are the verses that have either blepo or ide from horao in them okay but I'm going to focus now on the next anaphora kurias now kurias is pointedly used I've already done the videos on how Matthew uses it every time you see the word kurias it's it's literally placed strategically placed the word order doesn't matter so they're placing the word order of kurias in Matthew at the very time reformers Bible translations Bible manuscripts come out that's not what Mark's doing but he's playing on that that same usage so now for kurias the anaphora the first use of kurias there's only two is in verse 20 and the second is in verse 35. This is really a killer. I'm sorry it sounds so boring, but it won't be once you understand it. So here we go. Here's verse 20. First use of kurios. Alright? You'll notice that the clause just prior to it, which is hysterical, the clause just prior to it is 693. It's 7. It's divisible by 7. The reason I say it's hysterical is at the very beginning of this word renete, which means sired. The very start of the word is when Leo the Third sires his son, who's going to be called Constantine the Fifth, as co-emperor. And at that moment, Constantine the Fifth is two years old. So, you know, genete me genete could have been put earlier in the sentence, but by putting it right here, it's playing on Leo III and Constantine in particular, Constantine V, when he was only two years old. Now, that matters a bunch once you know something about the history of Leo III and Constantine V. Okay? which you'll get to see when you go look at the blepo haha <laughs> the blepo references because they reference these two guys but his year of birth I mean his year of birth as an emperor he, he's already born but I mean the birth of his emperorship is marked right here at the beginning of the end of the day the siring it's usually translated to be born, but it means it, it has really comes from genomai to become. Okay, but it's got that sound play. See, sound play is a really big thing in Greek. It's got that sound play on genao. So, Mark took advantage of it, or God had Mark took advantage of it. I wonder how much these guys knew when they were doing their prophecies. Okay, but you'll notice it ends at 693, which is divisible by 7. So now we begin a new paragraph. This is the end of the old paragraph. It's divisible by seven. The history, as it were, is divided up into chapters and paragraphs. This one has just ended. And, and the text is saying that the, that the upcoming tribulation is so bad, it, until now, it's never you know been so bad. Okay, but it's also true paradigmally because at the time this happens, 
See, here's the word for tribulation, ellipsis. There are many different types of tribulation. And it's like a succession of, oh, this is the worst thing that could ever happen. It can never be worse than this. And then something else comes along. Oh, this is the worst thing that can be happening. It's, it can never be worse than this. <coughs> That's what's being portrayed here. A rollout of things that they shouldn't get worse. It's not possible it'll ever be worse again. And then a new thing happens. And it'll never be worse again than it is now. But it is. It's until the, that point of that particular tribulation, it's never been so bad until the next one, which is actually worse. And then it is the first place winner of it's never been so bad, okay? Because that's what Daniel predicted in Daniel 9.26. That's why Christ said wars and rumors of wars until I come. We're stuck in a time bubble because he died seven years early. He didn't fulfill his time. So that's why church had to exist. Okay. And if you're not familiar with that accounting. Um, golly, I don't know where else to tell you to go. It's real obvious from the numbers and the begats. But, you know, talk to somebody or go see my How God Orchestrates Time Channel in Vimeo. Okay, I'm going to move along faster now. So now that it's seven, we start a new paragraph. And since this is 693, this chi is syllable 694. Keep that in mind. That's verse 20. That's the first use of chorios, but it's not the last one. The last one is in verse 35. So now we go all the way down to verse 35. And here we are, verse 35. Gregorete. And basically, you know, be alert. You don't know when the Lord is coming home. That syllable count ends at 1226. Now, remember the first one? The first one up here was 694. Because we're ending the paragraph here and we're starting a new one. The second, it ends... It's just the whole clause, Koryas in it, is 12.26. Now watch this. This is a killer. 12.26 minus 6.90. See it? 4. Where the chi is? That's 532. And guess what? It's divisible by 7. Huh? Ding, 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 ding. Now, do you think any of the scribes knew that when they were copying? Huh? We know they didn't. Because here's this extra word in here. It kind of. And scholars say, well, how are you so sure that that word isn't really in Mark? Well, here's one way to know. If I go from 694 and then I count down to the last time Kurios is used, like a bunch of Russian nested dolls, the last time it's used, like an envelope, and I subtract one from the other, it's divisible by seven. Now, if that had only happened once or twice, you could say, well, oh, it's a coincidence. Okay, but hello, it's divisible by 7 every time. It's divisible by 7 from here to here to here to here to here to here between that one and, and this occurrence. Divisible by 7 each time each time. Same thing is true in Matthew 24 and 25. I mean, I've already done the mapping of those. Tohuyantu Anthropo is seven syllables, by the way. Ah, Tohuyantu Anthropo. Oh, that's six. I'm sorry. 
John Quion to Anthropo. I should say Anthropo. I never say the words right. John Quion to Anthropo. Ah, uh, seven. What do you know? John Quion to Anthropo. Seven. Yeah, son of man, the real one. Daniel 7.13, not the other uses of Son of Man in the Old Testament, because that's not the proper translation. They should say Son of Adam. Christ is not a Son of Adam. He was born of a virgin. And that was the last time she was a virgin. It's Parthenogenesis. She wasn't immaculate. He was. Anyway, and it's divisible by seven from the last time of Blepite to E day. And here's another E day. And guess what? Look at this. Look. E day, ho day, ho Christos. Oh, that's seven syllables too. So starting at the eighth one is the next E day. That's how come I know this little hay thing that belong in there. Because everybody else is divisible by seven. Okay, oh, curiosity, that's divisible by seven. Every time you get to these keywords, it's divisible by seven. Now, doesn't that tell you something? The copyist did not know. And we got proof they didn't know, because sometimes they stick in stuff like this. And how do I know that these words do not belong? Because they would wreck the divisibility by seven. I didn't know that there all these texts were going to divide by seven when I did it. I didn't know. Paul usually likes to have his distances be three. He likes to do things in multiple sets of three. But this is precision, baby. Seven divisible by seven divisible by seven in all their distances. Do it yourself. And not only that, but hello, the sum even though this, the ending is not divisible by 7. 12, 26, minus, 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 694 is 532, which is 76 sevens. Now, do you think God can count? Is it maybe just, maybe, really more than may be possible that oh it doesn't matter if we got these extra words in because all we got to do is figure out where the anaphora are and then when they go by seven then we know what words don't belong do you think God went to a certain amount of trouble to preserve the original word in the original languages that the writers really wrote that Jesus really said that Jesus really read huh Now that's not all there is, but I'm going to start coughing, so I'll come back.